session. Uh, this is an open forum uh, where we've brought some thought leaders and a moderator in to answer some questions and to take questions and just generally talk about what we're seeing in this interesting time. Lori, do you want to go to the next slide? Uh, that's good. That's a good slide too. So let's talk about how Zoom works. If you haven't gotten used to Zoom or you're using another tool, um, in this town hall, you have tools at the bottom, typically at the bottom of your screen, but if you kind of hover over parts of your screen, you'll find your toolbar. At this time, all of your mics and videos are set to off. You have control over them, but we would appreciate for the bandwidth to keep your video off and your mics off unless we're, you're going to be talking. Um, please um, type any questions you have, even if it's just a question about the technology and it's not working, feel free to type that into the chat window. And you'll see that you can open the chat window and you can choose who to chat with. My name is Lynn Yanyo and Lori Nicolini is with me behind the scenes. And if you choose either of us, we're going to help you behind the scenes. If you chat with Ralph, he may or may not see the question. So you, if you have a question and you want to type a question and have me pose it to the, the panel, feel free to type in the chat window. If you'd like to have your ask your question yourself, because maybe there's some follow up, you can raise your hand. Um, if you raise your hand, I can't take your hand back down, so you will also have to lower your hand after your question's answered. Um, if there is anything else that you're having a question about, again, please feel free to type in the chat window. We're also gonna have some polls in this meeting, and we'll describe how you do that as we go forward. If we can take the next uh, slide, Lori. All right, so here are, is our panel today. Uh, Jeff Bennett is joining us, um, and he's got a new book out, and Ralph is going to tell you all about it. Jerry Katz um, is our voice of the customer ex expert. He gave a fabulous webinar just Tuesday, and you're going to want to go back and look at that, and Ralph is going to tell you about that. And then we have Uncle Ralphie. Hi, Ralph. Um, Ralph will be moderating today, and it's really wonderful to have him back with us. And so, and again, Ralph has got years of experience in this world too, so he's probably got some insights. And then there's a nice picture of me because I no longer have good looking hair at this point. So we, I won't be live with <laughs> Ralph. Next slide. Okay, so Ralph, this is up to you now. So I'm handing it off to you. Okay, well then, um, why don't we take the poll slide down? Let's just, um, you know, warm Talk up for a minute, minute here, okay? And um, first of all, a heartfelt welcome to all of you out there. Uh, I, you know, I teach business marketing at the, on the Penn State campus now, and I usually start my classes with a warning. And the warning is this, I love this stuff. I just love this stuff. I've been practicing B2B marketing one way or another for over 50 years. I, I think I'm the oldest person in the room. And, um, and I, you know, B2B is something you, you've got to kind of love with all of its foibles and ups and downs. And I love this network and invite you to get deeply involved with it. Um, you know, take advantage of it. Call us if we can be of help, even if it's just for moral support through this time. And there's a tremendous range of emotions out there right now from people who are just hunkered down, from people who are sort of stir crazy, to people who are dealing with some serious health issues. So I'm, I'm railing against the term social isolation. I don't like it. Uh, physical isolation, I think I can understand. But social isolation is used as a punishment in a lot of prisons. It's called solitary confinement. And um, I think we need each other more than ever. So thank you. Forming a network, making new network connections is an important part of what we do um, here in this net, uh, ISBM network. So thanks for joining us and keep building the network. First of all, again, my, my pleasure too now to introduce our two panelists with us and good friends and friends for a long time, Jeff Bennett. Um, Jeff founded Amphora Consulting back in 2003, and I met Jeff in a, in a frenetic working session uh, that happened um, at Honeywell International, which wound up being the beginning of the design process for their strategic marketing program. And uh, he's been a great colleague. He teaches classes for us, including uh, one that had really was sort of resonated with several firms, Greenbelt for Growth, together with Dr. Stuart Byther from, uh, from uh, Penn State. And then recently, um, Jeff has authored this great book, Grassroots Strategy, um, you know, cultivating B2B growth from the ground up. And uh, Jeff and I had sort of orchestrated how I could hand this off to him in Zoom, but that's been kind of tough <laughs> to do. Jeff, talk to us about briefly about grassroots strategy. Why grassroots? I know you picked that title, you know, um, with some real thought. 
Yeah, Ralph, I guess, uh, first of all, thank you for being here and, and thank you for digging out my high school graduation photo for the, uh, <laughs> the presentation there. That, that looks great. Um, so the grassroots strategy is meant to be sort of the opposite of ivory tower strategy. Uh, we think that too many companies, in particular B2B, um, get stuck thinking that strategy is someone else's job and strategy has to come down from on high in the corner office and only certain rarefied consultants and, and gurus can, can come up with strategy. And our, in contrast to that, we think that good ideas can come from anywhere. Uh, and in particular, good ideas often come from people visiting and observing customers interacting with their product or service. Um, not everything from the bottom up is a good idea. So what we describe in the book is a disciplined process for evaluating ideas and opportunities, walking them through a series of steps, understanding customer value, market segmentation, et cetera. And we believe that organizations that broadly teach those skills will thrive in the long term and be better positioned to adapt. Yeah, and I, I you know, and it, I would just say that uh, I don't know how many times that um, Jeff and his team have run the strategic marketing planning process. I lost count after about 50. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of distilled practical stuff in there from working in the field. My, my pleasure now to introduce Jerry Katz. And I'm, I'm, I, you know, Jerry, I'm so impressed. I just went through, he had run a webinar for us on Tuesday where he took a look at the application of artificial intelligence to VOC in a very practical real world way now. So I wanna thank you for that, Jerry. Um, and um, Jerry is sort of our go-to guy for voice of the customer. Jerry, do you do you get to a chance to talk with that Abby Griffin every now and then still? Or um, I do. Good. Yeah, I talk to Abby periodically, and she's doing well and misses all of you. Yeah, no, and for those of you online, Abby Griffin is another of our ISBM fellows. Uh, she's at University of Utah, and she and John Hauser are actually credited with inventing the term "voice of the customer." And if you, you know, Jerry's webinar will be up on our website for those of you who didn't get to see it. And I really recommend it because he's talking about how to unleash a bunch of data that you undoubtedly have. You've got it. How do you gather insights from it? And there are new tools that are, that are applicable to help you with that. So thanks to you both. Um, as um, Lynn was mentioning, we're going to be using some polls today to, uh, to kind of and we're inviting you on in to the, uh, to, to, you know, we love data. And there's enough of you online where we can actually gather some real data. Just let me point out these polls, of course, uh, are absolutely voluntary. There's no requirement that you take them. And uh, we will hold all of the individual responses confidential and the way this polling process works. Um, you know, you'll get to see the data uh, kind of reduced for you, you know, right on the screen. So, you know, with, as I'd mentioned, our thoughts and prayers are with you. And particularly with those frontline personnel that might be in your firm, that are out there from your mailman to people in stores to certainly the frontline workers in hospitals and other things. And I think as we react to the changing environment, we all have a kind of a different internal temperature we're developing. So um, I think what I'd like to do then, Lori, go ahead and bring up the first poll. So this is just kind of a temperature check to get a feeling for those of us who are in this virtual room with us. Because there's some folks I've talked to, you know, it's, if you're up against something really hard, you know, it's pretty depressing. You might find yourself at number one. And I've tried to come up with some words that are sort of in the middle, all the way up to, hey, number five is, you know, it is what it is. I, I got this. I, I'm handling it. And then there's sort of two, three, and four where you're kind of in the middle. So Lori, uh, go ahead and put up the poll. And we give you a few seconds to go ahead and vote. Give us your, um, give us your uh, flavor of where you are right now so we can kind of feel what the temperature is in the room. If we were together, you know, face to face in a big room, uh, we could sense that, but I'm trying to get a sense for it now. So we'll give you a few seconds to please continue voting. And Laurie, when you think the time is right, why don't you show us the results, please? Okay, just so take a few seconds here. And remember, please, please share with us. This is voluntary. Okay, good. It looks like it's kind of stabilized, Lori. Go ahead. Okay, here we are. And uh, this is interesting, not unexpected, okay? I think most of us have kind of come in at that uh, kind of four out of five level. 
you know, we're, we're all pretty tough. And, but it, it, remember that as you're working with people in your value chain, some folks are really up against very hard stuff. Uh, others are just going stir crazy. And I can see the mix here. So my first message to you from this is it's time to be a really good citizen of your value chain, of the chain looking up to your suppliers and down to your customers. You know, and I, one thing I always loved about business to business is it's personal. You know, you get to know your customers, your key contacts, the people inside the firms that you work with. Uh, reach out to them. And uh, this is more than just a nicety now. It's something that's necessary. So thank you very, very much uh, uh, for uh, being with us here on poll number one. Okay. So, Lori, um, I think probably should take that poll down and let's just go to, um, um, you know, back to the, um, the screen. And um, let's get underway and uh, kind of talk with Jeff and Jerry. So I'm going to start with, with Jeff. Jeff, you have a broad point of view across a lot of business to business firms and um, work with a lot of different sorts of teams at firms of different sizes. What do you see as the biggest change, change that's, changes you've seen impacting B2B marketing functions here uh, during this time? And what are some tips you can give us on how to deal with those changes? Right. Ralph, well, that's a great question. And it really goes back to a conversation that you and I have been having for almost 17 years on, on what is the role of marketing in B2B. And I think this is really testing that for many companies. If at the one extreme, you view the role of marketing as essentially the functional spend of marketing dollars, uh, that's never a good way to think about marketing. And that's really come under fire now because at most of my clients, uh, budgets are at best frozen uh, and probably getting slashed, right? So if you're just kind of the receiver of spending that money, um, you know, and by the way, that makes sense, right? One of my clients called that cash preservation mode. When you've got uncertainty ahead, you want to preserve cash because cash gives you options. You know, having 10,000 extra brochures is hard to turn back into cash. Um, so if that's, if that's the way you view marketing, uh, this, is, this is a tough time and you're on the receiving end of, you know, lots of unhappy news and, and budget cuts. Uh, on the other hand, the way we think you should think about marketing uh, is you know, the core function that thinks about customer needs and value up and down the value chain and how to use our differentiation to develop segment targeted strategies to capture more of that value. Uh, in that sense, then marketing is more important than ever and marketing should be front and center. Uh, remembering that in B2B, you know, all demand is derived demand. We often, we usually don't see the end customer, the consumer, so the time is now to be thoughtful about not what are our direct customers saying, what are their customers saying, how do we, what do we, what's our perspective on the problems they'll face and the perspective that they'll have both now and hopefully in the not too distant future coming out of this in some form or fashion, and how can we solve those problems in a way that, that gives us some advantage. So I think that's that developing that perspective. Um, and if you haven't done that up until now, maybe this is a good time to do so uh, because you know, you're know you not traveling to visit customers. Your customers probably aren't traveling to visit their customers. This is a good time to start those dialogues and build that objective view, objective perspective on what's happening down the value chain and how is that going to affect you, not just today, but again, coming out of this. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to build on that for a second, too, before we get to Jerry, is that this business of being a good citizen of the value chain or the value web. And by the way, uh, another new book to be looking for um, is from our uh, ISBM fellow, Eric Jakumstaller, on what he's expanded all this to call it an interaction field. You know, and, and sometimes in little chalk talks we've done together at ISBM, we kind of write down a big list of what flows through a value chain. And a lot of stuff flows through it. And to be brutally candid, a lot of stuff flowing through the value chain right now is adding to the noise, the uncertainty. It's, it's just not helping. So my suggestion to you as a marketer, no matter where you are, is you know, try, take control of what's communicated in your value chain. Be very careful, particularly moves on things like price, which send shockwaves through the value chain if you don't do them correctly. Uh, Joanne Smith are, um, was a you know, head of strategic pricing at DuPont teaches our course in this. And she is, she is in the middle of teaching one now and will teach one later on in June. I strongly suggest that. At our last town hall, she had some very important tips on 
being very careful how you communicated pricing moves, how you sent, you sent facts down the value chain. You equipped your people who were on the front line to handle things like allocation. Uh, God forbid, don't ship virus through the value chain. That's uh, one of the things that worries me. It's not, not clear how long this thing uh, lives on certain surfaces. So be careful about this. So that's, that's what I mean about being a good citizen of the value chain now. And I think marketing's front and center on that. Jerry, moving to you, since you're our, our, our all-time guru now and gentle teacher on voice of the customer, even for those of us who sometimes misuse that term, how is the, how is this current environment, from your point of view, impacted this whole business of customer insight um, research? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, uh, I almost feel guilty saying this. Every business conversation I have starts with that question. You know, how's business? How's this affecting you? And I have to say, it hasn't affected us that much so right. far. And uh, please don't throw things. No. Uh, the the uh, and I think the reason is that market research, not just voice of the customer, not voice of the customer research, but almost all of market research lends itself beautifully to being done remotely. Uh, we've had very little difficulty working remotely. And um, uh, so we've had really very few cancellations or postponements. Uh, we've even been awarded a few new projects since the, uh, crisis began. So uh, now that you've finished throwing things at me, uh, uh, let me say, I don't expect this to last because of exactly what Jeff just said. Budgets are going to get slashed. Uh, we've already had some prospective projects that said, you know, we got to be on hold for the next three months or six months, whatever. But uh, um, I have to say, and I, I know this is self-serving, uh, and Jeff said the same thing here, now is actually a perfect time to be doing market research. And that's partly because the technology makes it possible. And partly because, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, in business to business market research, the biggest problem is often finding the right people to talk to. And even if you can identify them, which is a hugely difficult problem, getting an hour of their time or more than that is also difficult. Well, think about it, everybody's at home now. Nobody's traveling. People are looking for diversion. And so we've actually seen uh, that recruiting has gotten a little easier and a little less expensive, which is just remarkable. So um, uh, my answer, Ralph, is hasn't been too bad. Well, you know, I think just, just to point an insight to everyone who's listening, what I'm hearing from Jerry, and we had a chat about this beforehand, and in fact, I've worked with several member firms on projects where they're telling me, well, you know, now's not the time to invest. We're going to have to back off. But in fact, for those of you out there, listen to what Jerry's saying. This might be one of the most effective and essentially inexpensive times to do insight research. You may be buying at the bottom to a certain extent because of just what Jerry's saying, because I know I've, I've worked with a lot of firms on various research projects and Jerry has highlighted the big problem is, well, who do I talk to? Hmm, now I know who to talk to, but boy, try to, get, try to get her on the phone for a half hour. She's very busy. She's got a million things going on. Uh, in this situation, this may be uh, actually a, a golden moment here to look at, well, what actually is better now? And that boy, that, that list is not that big. But this is a situation where you might want to highlight that as a business marketer, that the, the time to do this kind of research, particularly research where you have to get a primary contact point to, uh, to reveal some information, might be, might be the right time. So I think what I'm going to ask is um, the, um, uh, now to bring up the uh, second poll, to, to get a handle on what, what has your role been in, in handling this? Um, as marketers, where have you been? Have you been involved from the very beginning, front and center, in shaping strategy and being on the lead on this? Um, or have you kind of, you know, and you can see number, of, you know, number five, have you not been involved at all or only remotely? And then we have intermediates here. You've been involved in meeting full way, but kind of called in at key points. Uh, you're sought, you know, to respond to specific questions, or are you called in after the fact? So um, again, we just give you a few seconds here to kind of check in on this. Okay. And you know, uh, please do your best job of letting us know how you've been called as a B2B marketer 
and in terms of your role in helping your firm um, deal with this particular situation. So um, again, I'm going to kind of leave it to Lori and um, Lynn who see the uh, responses coming in and we'll, we'll kind of wait till that kind of tapers off. But thanks to Jeff and Jerry for your openers on this. And it'll be interesting to see um, the, you know, the, the extent to which we, you're, in, you're involved, okay? It looks like we have about 60% uh, of the participants. Okay. All right. So, well, this, this actually is quite encouraging. Um, and, you, you know, well, it should be. And I think this ties to what, what Jeff has been talking about and what Jerry is talking about, because we're kind of heavy up on the idea that you've been involved deeply. And this is a place where maybe it's, it's, it's an important time to step up and be certain. Again, when I, when I look at what's coming through the value chain in terms of demand that's whipping all over the place, uh, costs which are going up in some cases, down in others, et cetera, um, this is a time where your perspective is more valuable than ever in making sure that we don't send any more noise into the value chain. Right now, these value chains are uh, almost as noisy as the stock market um, and um, kind of tough. Okay. Yeah, so, so Lynn, you have a you have a question for the from the audience. So I had a question come in from the audience, and it really relates to um, you know our encouragement to be talking to our customers. And so the question is, isn't it um, likely that customer opinion might be a little bit twitchy now? Um, they're in the midst of uh, lots of change, and would we get the wrong signals if we talk to them now? Would 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 it be better to wait a few months until things settle down? Well, um, I'd be glad to take a cut. Sure, jump that. in, Jerry. Please. Yeah, it depends on what you want to talk to them about. If it was a, a um, how are you feeling or an attitude study, yeah, I think that would be um, that would be affected. But for something like voice of the customer, where you're trying to understand customer needs, uh, so long as you can keep the discussion focused on that, I don't see any reason why it would be different now than it you know would have been five months ago. Uh, likewise, if they were evaluating a concept or a prototype, I, I don't think uh, I, don't, I don't think it would be that affected. Yeah, and I think um, I I again with that kind of focus, I, I, I would agree with Jerry. Now, again, some uh, given some of the questions I'm asking here, you know, you may be under strict. Well, don't tell anybody how we're doing. Don't tell anybody about uh, our performance. Don't tell anybody about, you know, uh, you know, anything that might scare them. And then to a certain extent, that's understandable. But if you've been sitting, you know, in the middle of some sort of um, kind of uh, launch process or innovation process, and you really are focused on a, uh, how do we create a winning customer value proposition in this specific place? What other elements of value can we discern? Um, uh, in fact, I would, I would agree with Jerry. I think the people I'm talking to uh, are kind of compartmentalizing what's going on with the crisis and looking forward to things that, that might speak to business continuing in the future. Okay, so, um, so thanks for that. Um, okay, so um, Jeff, let me go back to you here. Um, your question that came in is, what can we do to keep our focus on the strategic, the, the long term, while we're so bound up in trying to deal with this day to day? And it sort of does tie together to the question that came in. Right. Well, Ralph, um, it's almost impossible to answer that question without first agreeing on a definition of what a strategy is. Oh, there uh, you but go. I don't <laughs> I don't want to take the whole session to do that. Uh, you and I have had that discussion before as well. Um, but one of the fundamental tenets of strategy is strategy is about choice what you choose to do, what you choose not to do, where you choose to focus, what segments you focus on, what capabilities you build, et cetera, in part for the simple reason that if you try to do everything a little bit better, you'll be mediocre at everything and, and never, never build a winning hand. Um, so I think it, you know, if you didn't know your strategy coming into this, it's probably a good time to stop and try to articulate that. Are you framing the choices you're making today? And you know, make no mistake, almost every company is making difficult choices, which employees to keep, which employees to lay off, at, you know, how to protect employees that, that continue to work, et cetera. Those are difficult choices. But if they're not making those in a strategic context, in essence, that becomes their strategy, the sum total of those decisions and where they focus. And you're exactly right, the, or the implication is right. The risk is we bounce from one short-term decision to another 
that adds up to a de facto strategy that was very different than where we wanted to go. So making those decisions with an eye to where do we want to be in the future, what capabilities do we need to preserve, and not falling for things like let's cut 20% across the board, but rather let's preserve things. I think about, um, you know, a lot's been written about how Honeywell dealt with the 2008-2009 downturn. And they did a lot of things that were unpopular at the time, like forced vacations and furloughs rather than layoffs uh, and surgically cutting budgets, completely eliminating some things, but not cutting in other areas, uh, which made obviously some people unhappy, but allowed them to, and, and even protecting some suppliers, right? Rather than just demanding mm -hmm. lower prices when they could, that driving some uh, suppliers to bankruptcy they picked a few partner suppliers and continued to pay them even when they weren't shipping parts so that they could come out screaming uh, you know, when the, when the downturn was over. So I think it is possible to make short-term decisions uh, to make it through, but also to you know, think strategically about the position you're going to come out on the other side. That's that, interesting. And by the way, the, you hit one of my hot points, which is you know, the language, the language of strategy. Uh, uh, the, the business, if for those of you who haven't seen this paper, are you sure you have a strategy by Don Hambrick? That is a great paper with a great framework for answering that question in very crisp terms. And if anyone of you want a copy of that paper, all you do is email me and I will be glad to, to get you one. Uh, I found it to be something I go back to again and again to sort of answer that question. Are, are we making decisions in the framework of a strategy? Jeff, you brought up now Honeywell making some important decisions uh, back in 2008, 2009. Uh, Jerry, I'm gonna bounce that back to you. You know, marketing lessons from previous situations like this. I mean, we've been, we've never quite been through this sort of situation before, but we, we've all lived through some good times and bad times. Lessons we've learned that you think we ought to pull out of the closet and get back back on uh, as some guidance for us now? Um, you know, there are some classics that I think are taught in business schools all the time now. Uh, and the three that come to mind are um, uh, Rely Tampons, which was a Procter & Gamble product, uh, Tylenol, which was a Johnson & Johnson product, and Audi. Uh, and the first two of those were handled, handled magnificently. Tylenol supposedly pulled every, everything off the shelf, just ate the cost, and uh, continued unscathed once they got manufacturing and got the pipeline again. Uh, likewise, Rely Tampons withdrew over $20 million, and this is 25 years ago, uh, for the um, toxic shock syndrome problem. They withdrew all the product and actually killed the brand. Of course, uh, they got the last laugh because what they ended up doing was taking that technology and putting it into their diapers. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of the thinner uh, disposable diapers. So they ended up not just, uh, they ended up turning a loss into a win. Now the bad example is Audi. And I actually owned one at the time, the sudden acceleration problem, where they just went into denial mode and said, no, there's no problem here. There's no problem here. And as an owner, what that meant was the resale value of my car literally dropped by three to $5,000 overnight. And I was furious about it. I've never bought another one since then. Uh, so, you know, what are the lessons? Well, A, you got to tell the truth. Uh, B, you take responsibility, even if it's not your own, even if it's not your fault. You know, what the Audi guy should have said is, hey, we all drive Audis. Our wives and children all drive Audis. We're concerned about this too. And we're going to try to get to the bottom of it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, of course, the third thing is you got to bear whatever cost it takes in order to maintain trust, because if, if your customers lose trust in you, you'll never get it back. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's, it's intriguing, again, for your marketers out there, to, in my view, the, the lesson from all this is what are the opportunities to build trust? What are the opportunities to turn the potential into, into you know, a win? Like the business to business example Jeff was citing is, um, well, I know that I, I'm hearing all over, well, the price of oil is going down. So many of our uh, members have offerings that where uh, a petroleum feedstock is part of it. So, um, all right, we, you know, uh, oil is down this percent. We want this from you. Be very careful. 
be careful upstream and downstream. You know, um, an unthought, well, not well thought through price move has impacts through the whole value chain. Also, beating your upstream suppliers up, um, although good marketers don't, you know, don't do that, but this is, not a, this is a time to make sure that the supply chain can continue in a robust way as the, these things unfold. And um, marketers, I think, are in a unique perspective to take a look at that. And again, in B2B, we know firms that are all the way up the supply chain and the value chain, way up. Like one of our member firms sells raw bromine. That's pretty much way, way up the value chain. All the way down to firms that are a lot closer to the point of consumption. And knowing that and providing that perspective, uh, you know, can be key right now. So um, I'm seeing that I, I had asked a good friend of mine, Steve Sternberger, who is the chief marketing officer at Harbison Walker to kind of jump in. And Steve, I'm gonna do a professor thing and um, cold call on you here. It's good <laughs> to see you. Um, first of all, how are you? How are things going? You need to make sure you're unmuted here, Steve. I, I don't know if I can do that or if um, Lynn can do oh, that. Can you hear me now? Now we got you, yeah. Great, uh, nice to see you. Yeah, I'm joining you from uh, sunny Pittsburgh today. Good, good, good. So, uh, um, yeah. you doing, doing okay? Yeah, it, it, it's been some challenging times. Uh, just, a, a, you know, if you look at the arc of the last uh, seven weeks have been um, like life-changing in our business and uh, in our marketing department, especially. Uh, we, you know, as of um, eight weeks ago, we were about to have a run of, of seven or eight major trade shows and events. Oh. Uh, we had a half million dollar customer event that was supposed to be going on this week in uh, in um, Orlando. So on a dime, uh, we had to cancel all these events, all, all the uh, trade shows and like everything through our big spring promotion season. But then we turned to, and our budget was set from, you know, a million two to zero and in this time, but, but we kind of regrouped and said, well, what can we do in this situation? And it's really sparked a lot of creativity. So all of the content and all the messaging that we've created for all these different end market events, uh, we've turned around and said, well, how can we do this low cost, no cost through social media and digitally? Uh, yesterday, we um, held our first online uh, training for these customers that were going to be at this event this week. We had 250 people. We maxed out our Skype connection and we're, we're saying, what can we do to get 400 people into a training class? We uh, launched internal training. Uh, we're, we're going through the um, script for our first podcast. We're starting a technical podcast that goes out to all of our customers and have that planned out through the end of the year. So just a, just a ton of um, really positive activity to say, well, the, the messaging that we wanted to get out, the content that we created was meant for a certain channel. So how do we redeploy that in creative ways with little to no spend and, um, and, and launch these things we've always wanted to get to, but just never had the time because we were busy executing all this other stuff. And uh, we know that on the other side of it, we're still going to maintain this activity and do the other stuff. So it, I, I think it, it's a great time to kind of reset and, and, and take stock of what's really important are our really smart people and what we bring to our market and to our customers and still get that message out. We also felt we, we're just starting this, um, actually this week, I, you know, our feeling was that three weeks ago, we would have been perceived as carpet baggers. You know, that it, everybody was reacting to, uh, everybody's reacting to all the, uh, the chaos and working from home or the changing, you know, shut down, not shut down. We felt that the past three weeks or so or four weeks was, was there was too much turmoil to really focus on our, our commercial message. And we had a really tight COVID um, we had our, our executive team at every day at 5.30. We have 30 distribution sites around the company and seven plants that make refractory materials. So it was much more about the safety of our workers and then the, the, the reliable supply of our product. We, we supply critical industries, so none of, our, none of our sites were shut down. We serve the steel and the aluminum and the glass markets and a lot of critical industries that... Um, and pulp and paper, I mean, there's been a huge run on pulp and paper with, uh, with the toilet paper uh, shortage and everything. So we, we serve all these critical industries. So it was all about how do we secure supply, secure safety, and have good, reliable, consistent messaging. We knew if we didn't have really tight messaging that went all throughout our organization and throughout our value chain, the people would fill in the blanks with their worst uh, fears or whatever they saw on TV. Yeah, this so our, our, sort of, uh, yeah, this fill in the blanks problem and getting ahead of that. And, and um, 
you know, and, and thank, you know, Steve, thank, first of all, thanks a million for jumping on. And I would invite sure. any of you, you know, we have two experts on the panel, uh, a third expert here from, uh, from our membership. Any of you in our membership wants to raise your hand for Lynn and uh, talk about some of the things you're doing you'd like to share. That would make this, I mean, if we were in a town hall, I would be cold calling like mad. And again, I'm, I'm a professor now. I spent 23 <laughs> years in business, but now I've spent about 24 years as a professor. So this cold calling makes me extremely popular with my MBA students. And um, so I'd be, I'd be more than willing to jump in on that, but uh, some really good insights. The other thing is often, often, experience is the key differentiator in many, many, um, and, and being creative about how you create experiences. I think we've seen a lot of changes in budgets and market communications, um, but um, the, the, um, the critical thing, you know, and often market communications has trade shows as the number one spend in the budget for many of us. And I think a lot of us are going to learn now, um, whether we like it or not, how to better deploy uh, virtual experiences as yeah. part of the mix. One of the things here, by the way, it's been just touching close to home on the university campus, for those of you who have university students, particularly those folks who are about to graduate, is that we're faced with a virtual commencement cele um, celebration, be, yeah. which somehow, um, somehow is uh, it's going to be very, very different, but we, we are going to do what we need to do to make that an experience. So, Lynn, did you have another question, um, and uh, or can Ralph, we call Ralph, on could some? I could I yeah, build Jeff. on something Steve yeah, said? I'm sorry, I saw you had your hand up, kind of. Yeah, sorry, uh, I, I I physically had my hand up. Not the, I know I saw that. I'm, I'm sorry, the technology. but it was, it was just uh, kind of hiding behind your name on the screen here. So, yeah. So, yeah. For, first of all, Steve, Pittsburgh looks great there. I love that view from Mount Washington. It's a shame the great restaurants up there are closed uh, at this yeah. time. Mm -hmm. But I think um, as I was thinking about what Steve was saying, I'm sort of generalizing um, the view from my clients that if you think about this, by my count, we're in roughly the sixth week of, of whatever this crisis is going to end up being called. Um, and I'm beginning to think that it, for many people, it kind of came in chunks. The first two weeks was shock. You know, maybe this isn't going to happen. Do we really need to shut down? We were sorting for waiting for someone else to tell us what to do. The next two weeks, we just put everything on hold. Uh, you know, we told people they had to work from home, but the honest truth was, unless they really had critical stuff to do, most folks were dealing with kids that were now home from school and maybe working a little bit from home if they had to, but really just postponing things, putting everything on hold. I think in weeks uh, five and six, we got serious about how to adapt. You know, do we need to bring in extra crews in some parts? Do we need to make move to full-time layoffs in other areas? What, what do we, you know, is this trade show going to be rescheduled or is just start planning the 2021 show, right? Um, and I think the next two weeks are likely to be about planning for reopening. And I think that's where it's going to be really critical to understand. So again, Steve, a great example, your products that you sell to the pulp and paper industry, you're seeing a big spike because nobody can make enough toilet paper. Well, I'm pretty sure that's a short-term, not a long-term phenomenon, right? Because if you go all the way to the end user, we're not actually using more toilet paper. We're just scared that someone's going to run out. So we're stocking up whenever we can, right? And, and I, you know, I think we can all plead guilty to doing the same thing, right? I happened to see it at the store the other day and bought as much as I could. That's, you know, that's a short-term behavior that at some point we'll, we'll hopefully back out of or everyone will build their personal stockpile and then we won't have to do it again. So I think a, a couple great lessons there that I heard in that story. Thanks, Steve. Je Jeff, can I, can I respond to that? Um, sure. So you're the culprit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. There Come was on. actually, there was a really interesting article uh, that my daughter sent me a few weeks ago that pointed out that it wasn't just hoarding that was causing the toilet paper, uh, toilet paper problem. Uh, this is a great lesson in supply chain and segmentation. There's really two industries for toilet paper. There's the commercial industrial, mm -hmm. which is usually single ply, recycled material, inferior, but it's the stuff we all have in our offices and every time you use the restroom in a university. Uh, in, yeah. in <laughs> and then there's the home market, which is all, you know, plush and, uh, and higher priced. And they're made in separate factories, they're distributed separately. Well, now that we're all home, we're all using 40% more of the home version right. rather than right. the commercial industrial. Yeah. I thought that was just fascinating. Yeah. And you know, it, it's interesting because that's very much a marketing perspective. 
And that's another thing I would enjoin the marketers there is that, and, and, and perhaps this is something you don't need to do, but across our member firms, what, one of the things we've enjoined people to do is connect with your own supply chain people. I mean, you really, as marketers, you're marketing into the supply chain of your downstream customers into that value chain. But, you know, I, and, and, you know, here at Penn State, we have, we're, we're lucky, we have a very strong supply chain program and we have the Center for Supply Chain Research. So a lot of the um, marketers who graduate from Penn State have a, have a secondary um, major in supply chain. But these two link together in B2B in very interesting ways. And there's knowledge and things to be learned from one another in terms of um, how we navigate times like this. And, and yet, occasionally, I see that marketers, for example, aren't connected with the purchasing people inside their own firm, where there's a good connection and learning to be happening there. And I'd suggest you do that. And select connecting with the supply chain people. Not only that, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity to do that. Because, you know, as Jerry is saying, uh, there, there is more... Um, you know, there's more uh, time now if you're going to do insights research with your customers and certain kinds of research, if you stay away from the emotional side of things, probably even more effective. But it's also a time to maybe reach out to people inside your firm and build connections there that could be valuable that, that you really haven't had time to do before. So be thinking about that. That's a little out of the ordinary kind of thinking. Okay. Um, again, uh, Vince Kostelnik, uh, I, I know I, I've seen from um, Lynn has a question for us. So um, Lynn, can you queue up Vince? Yep, Vince, you're up, you're unmiked. Or I'll just read your question. Okay. Oh, no, I'm good, I'm good. I thought I, I was trying to find the button, but I see you <laughs> share that for me. Hi so, Vince, good to, good to hear you. Thanks for coming online. Yep, good to, good to talk to you, Ralph. So, so my question relates to, we, we're making this shift now to virtual meetings, virtual events, and things of that nature. And as, uh, as the guy mentioned before, he has plans to go all the way through the end of the year. My question is, do these virtual meetings, events, do you think they'll continue to thrive after the current threat has been diminished or eliminated, or do you think they'll go away? I'll, I'll offer an opinion. I, I, I think this is here to stay uh, because the technology is pretty good. Um, you know, we, we found in our business, we, we used to always do presentations of market research study, uh, final results live. Uh, and most clients now don't want to pay the travel expense. You know, they feel like we can do this with Skype or Microsoft Teams or now Zoom and save that money. And it's just about as immediate uh, you know, our company has actually, uh, uh, we're, we're, in, we're regretting the separation and finding the tool so useful. We've been having weekly happy hours at five o'clock using <laughs> Zoom, and I recommend it. It works pretty well. You know, um, this may be a little off topic, but I'd recommend it too, by the way. I, I, it's interesting. Um, you guys out there can imagine that um, I, I get involved with my students, but after three classes, most of these guys have had enough of me. Uh, but I, I had a request from my last class to say, look, Ralph, would you just keep scheduling classes just for our mental health? We could do this. In fact, I have one tonight where the class just wants to get together and connect with one another just in a social environment because they're connecting through Zoom with their professors now. All of our classes at Penn State, like so many other places now, are purely online. And it's not really clear that we'll be back in the classroom in the fall. That's still very, very much up in the air at universities uh, um, you know, um, um, across the country. So we've talked about marketing and its evolution. I think it's time now to bring up a couple of other polls. So could we, let, let's bring up poll number three, which kind of ties to one of the questions we were talking about here. Uh, maybe just, just in the room here, and, and remember, this, we're, all of this is confidential. Um, you know, what's happening to your budget? Um, in, in some areas, has it gone up? Is it sort of staying the same and you're shifting it around? Is it down? Is it frozen? Or do you really don't know? Because uh, it, it's still, we're in this, we're in an interesting phase of this. So again, um, please vote as to whether or not, you know, you've found that you're being called in for more and your budget's gone up. Uh, has your budget sort of stayed the same, but you may be shifting it around across different sorts of tactics? Uh, has it been really, you know, cut and decreased? Um, and, you know, is everything frozen so that you, you know, that might be a separate question here that you're, you know, you're not spending anything right now, 
or in reality, the, the jury's still out, that your the decisions haven't been made on this in your firm, okay? So, um, so the, um, let's, um, let's go ahead and I'll wait till, um, okay. So th this sort of reflects uh, what, we've been, uh, what we've been seeing here, that uh, there are, some, you know, there's someone who's voted on in here that their budget has gone up and remained the same. As we expect, a lot of things have been decreased but, uh, and there's some frozen um, things in there. But I don't know, I guess what we're waiting for is how do we, how do we? And by the way, I know quite a few firms now, some of this may be for their own mental health, by the way, are getting on with, all right, what do we do when we come out of this? What do we do when they, we come out of this? Um, my, my brother, for example, works for Gartner, which is advising and counseling many, many firms now. And they're, they're in full tilt, you know, not only trying to come up with ideas for what you do now, but be thinking about what do we do when we come out of this and how do we do that? Let's go to poll number four, okay? Which is um, what, what really is happening to revenue right now? Um, are you really, is it too early to tell right now? Is this, are you gonna take a hit and it's gonna continue? Um, you're taking a hit now and it'll bounce back? What were things? pretty steady. I mean, if you're serving certain critical industries, as Steve was saying, it may be pretty steady. And then, or, you know, were you on a growth tread um, before this hit, and uh, do you expect it to return? So, too early to tell. Continued downward revenue impact over the long term. Um, short downturn, and then things kind of flattening out back to normal. Um, not much change right now. It's interesting. Jerry is one of the one who voted for that one. And then, uh, or are you seeing something that, um, you know, you're gonna get, you were on a growth trend and the growth trend will come back in your opinion. So um, dial in here and uh, I'll wait till, um, you know, Lynn and Lori, you know, let us know that most of you have voted. Hey Ralph, uh, this is Steve while folks are voting. Yeah. Uh, we're actually planning for four different scenarios right now. I think that's what a lot of companies are probably doing. Uh, tell us. So, so we're, we're looking at uh, what happens if there's a V, what happens if there's a U, mm -hmm. and then the third one we're calling the wheelbarrow, and then the fourth one is, is more like the L, the long-term structural change. So we, we've been doing scenario planning across the company for all four of those, because even though we serve critical industries, they're driven by um, GDP and by you know, end use markets for steel and, and things like that. So we, we have an economist on my staff that's actually putting together these different scenarios and we're, um, you know, coming up with contingencies for all four of them and then cool. see how it plays out. That's, a, that's an, interesting, an interesting, you know, approach to share is I think it is time to get on. And, and again, if you look at the, the results of this, um, th this kind of bell curve is, is something, I don't know whether I expected it or not. But um, I think most of us are hopeful, certainly, that uh, now there'll be a new normal. That's the, this, the you talk about a world like strategy. <laughs> you know, the word normal is going to be one of those misunderstood words in business right now, because I, I think there'll be a whole new view of what, what normal is. But um, thanks for you know, sharing. Most of you are expecting that you, you better get on as a marketer for planning what happens when you come back. And what will, what will we, um, what will be, uh, what will be in place? And I love the idea of multiple scenario planning. By the way, for those of you who are not experienced, um, maybe in doing that kind of scenario planning, and Steve's lucky as an economist helping him out, there's really a fundamental book on this by our fellow Liam Fahey called Learning from the Future, which is sort of a step-by-step -step approach to how you, how you do scenario planning. And Liam is one of our fellows and, um, you know, can, can give some advice and counsel on this and also, you know, uh, for a fee, lead one of these scenario planning exercises. But if you need help with any of this, again, please, I think uh, if an important takeaway here is we are on the phone, we're on the end of the email line, we're here to help if, uh, if you need us, okay? So any more questions, um, uh, Lynn, from the audience here? Because I have a couple more that came in earlier. Um, so Tim Wilson had a comment that I thought it would be good for us to let him share directly. Sure. Tim, if you could uh, unmute. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Tim. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, well I by was the way, just, Vince, uh, thanks for your question. And thanks to, to all for your answers. Okay, yeah, Tim, thanks uh, so much. Yeah, I just wanted to pile on, I guess, for the, uh, for the Zoom happy hours. And I was talking not only to business clients and people I work with, but also with friends and family that for a lot of people, 
these Zoom or, or however you want to do it, FaceTime, the technology doesn't matter, but getting the opportunity for folks to get together, this might be your only social outlet. And I, for, for those that are introverts, you may be enjoying uh, home confinement, but for everyone else who's extroverted, you kind of need that, that, uh, that external touch. So, you know, besides getting your teams together at five o'clock on a Friday, I would also uh, suggest that you reach out to kind of your circles is what I've been, I've been trying to do. Circles with friends, circles with families, uh, circles with our church group. Uh, we've been trying to reach out and it's, uh, it's really kind of eased the edge on a lot of this uh, home confinement. So I just wanted to uh, reach out that if folks are feeling, wow, there's something missing and I need to do something, th this would be a great outlet for you. It, it has been for me. And, and well, the, best, the best part, Tim, is nobody knows how much you're drinking. So, I mean, it's terrific that way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and, uh, you, and you know, you don't have to drive home. <laughs> right. <laughs> in so many places in business to business, you know, we, we try to produce the best offerings for our customer, but most of us are in very competitive markets. If you're selling a graded chemical or something like this, you're, you're offering at the product level, and we've talked about this maybe, you know, a lot, that your offering at the product level can be copied almost instantly. It's what you wrap around it, and ultimately around that are the relationships that add up to your brand. How many promises have you made that you've really kept so that people rely on you? And um, there's a lot of discussion going on in the brand world now about brands as friends that can create a feeling of wellness. Even the brands around your home. And then, by the way, how unwell you feel as a consumer when you look for your favorite brands and they're not there. All of a sudden, people are starting. I mean, this is something that really worries people. It sometimes subconsciously more than they know. Well, Sometimes when I'm talking to people about this, go, well, Ralph, that's business to consumer, business to business, this doesn't play. Listen, folks, it plays, it plays well. You know, be true to your brand now. Do the things that build your brand. Now that may not involve a happy hour, but it may involve a, you know, a call that's unexpected. Uh, it may involve an outreach that's unexpected. It may be, you know, um, you know, there's an outfit that's been around for quite a few years called the Coalition to End Social Isolation and Loneliness. Because as I said, social isolation and loneliness is uh, actually leads to disease. And I don't know how many of you have had to deal with an aging parent. I know my kids are looking forward to dealing with me, okay? But when I, when I look inside of what happens at some, some places where you go to retire, you know, social isolation and loneliness is an issue. So take an opportunity well, now to do things that just build a relationship, build the brand, okay? Ralph, if I can, can I just jump in on a couple quick things? First of all, that my email address there is AMS dash Inc. Uh, oh, okay, sorry, we have the wrong one. Okay. It's okay. Uh, I want to go back to Vince's question, and it also relates to what my friend Steve in my good old hometown of Pittsburgh had to say. Uh, th there are some things that will lend themselves very well to these uh, online tools and other things that won't. You know, in a trade show, part of what you want to do is let people fiddle around with a physical product. Mm. That can't be done remotely in most cases. In the world of market research, almost everything quantitative now is done by web or maybe telephone. But in qualitative research, when you're talking to people, let's say you're doing a concept evaluation or a prototype evaluation, some of those things can be communicated or even a conjoint analysis. Sometimes the stimuli can be communicated well over a photograph or a three-dimensional drawing over the web. Sometimes it doesn't. And if it's something they really have to hold and fiddle with, I think it, it's not going to work over, over the web. And you're just going to have to wait till you can get face-to-face -face again. And I, I don't know, I, I, it may be because of my age, but I think there are a whole crowd of people out there, me included, who are going to crave the person-to-person -person connection and the chance to really look into the eyes of people as well as let them see our offerings. Now, Lynn, you have some comments here. We're coming up on the half hour. Yeah, um, let, me, let me get this one in because I think uh, we want to have Jeff take a whack at this one. So Brian Christian asks us, will this crisis permanently increase corporate interest in black swan preparedness and reflecting disruptive threats in their strategy? Uh, thanks, Brian. I think the answer is yes. And I hope that companies do what Steve was talking about, which is get better and more serious about scenario planning. Because I think what we're seeing is companies that have planned for a range of outcomes, at least have some muscle memory of what to do. I mean, that was a lot of the 
uh, Jerry mentioned uh, Johnson & Johnson and the Tylenol crisis. They had been through scenario exercises of how to respond to a crisis, and that was part of why that, that leadership team responded so well. Um, I would suggest if history repeats itself for a lot of companies, they will find that we're very well prepared to deal with a respiratory-based virus that comes from China. And you know, <laughs> a lot of companies will be fighting the last war, unfortunately, and not thinking more broadly about, like you said, the black swan lesson and what other disruptions. I do think, uh, and it comes back to that point a couple people have made, sorting out what is temporary and what is permanent, we will see some permanent changes in supply chains and across a lot of industries, um, how much is sourced from China and how much safety stock you hold where, uh, people will be rethinking that, especially with uh, increasing emphasis and all the way up to the board level on risk management. I, I think we're likely to broaden the definition much like after the financial crisis, people thought more broadly about financial risk and leverage and exposure. We're gonna think more broadly about risk now to some of these unforeseen global events. So I, I hope there's some lessons to be learned there. Well, and I, I build up on that is that uh, there are many firms I've visited where I asked them, you know, the question, all right, there's a crisis today, show me what you're going to do. In some firms, the answer is, uh, you know, I, I, in other firms, I'm walked to here, hey, let me show you the war room where we're going to, right. you know, here's a list yeah. of people that are all now working for me because I'll head up the communications, here's all the tools we need, and they've got the basics in place. Now, to be fair, th this is a pandemic, and most of us, aside right. from those of us who may remember the polio scares back in the in the 40s and 50s, um, I know there's never quite been one like this. But I think the answer to your short answer to your question is maybe, maybe. If we think of this Ralph, as too isolated an incident, it could be scary if we're not ready. Okay, Ralph, I have one other uh, prognostication. Uh, one of the things that I remember from the Watergate crisis is that immediately after that ended, journalism programs in colleges and universities shot through the roof because every young person wanted, wanted to be an investigative reporter. They wanted to be the next Woodward or Bernstein. Well, I'm gonna make a prediction. I'll bet you that public health programs are going to explode in the next year or two. And for those who are statistically minded, I think the field of epidemiology is going to be a new uh, a new major for a lot of young people uh, yeah, it because it's right on the forefront and it requires all those same skills. We'll see. We'll see how young people shift their career paths from this. All right, Lynn, you had some other things to add? Yeah, so I want to just uh, say, one, that we're closing up on the hour, and I appreciate um, all the interaction, and I think this was great that we got folks to talk to each other, and I'm going to follow up with something that Rashness told me at the very end, but I want to remind everybody that after this particular event, you're going to get a survey, sorry that it's electronic and it's going to come to you by email, but we're looking to improve this every time. So it would be dandy if you would just give us some hints of what you liked and what we could improve on this town hall. That's the first thing. The second is that we have another town hall next week, which is actually on crisis communication. And you've alluded to that, Ralph. So I think you're gonna all wanna sign up and hang out on that one, um, where we have two professionals talking about uh, managing your communications around everything, around this kind of, kind of crisis thing. And then I wanted to end up with what Rachna Patel has been telling me, and she's actually sent this out because I, Ralph, this is right up your alley. Um, the first thing is that because, you know, when people are hosting these meetings, there's this background noise that can come from other things in your home that you didn't expect. Perhaps your dog is growling or you have children. And, and so to kind of make that more comfortable for her teams, they have started um, starting their meetings by having people bring their dogs or their kids on <laughs> to say hello. So people know what it is that it might be there. And then it's not so much of a, a, um, a stigma, right, around uh, not having a quiet um, conference area, right? Or maybe they're sharing recipes or doing other things. And then she's said that there's this thing called house party, which now I'm going to go look for, um, which is a way to play games like Pictionary or something. It's kind of like a yeah. brain screen. So, um, and I think, it, uh, so I'm just going to say, Rush has got the deal going on here. So if you also want some other ideas about how to keep going electronically, she's the one. So thank you for those, uh, the, the supplying that. I really, really appreciate that. I'm going to turn it back to you, Ralph, for the last minute 
to close. Okay, well, just some final tips, guys. Any uh, any tips you can give uh, any of you who've been on? Um, you know, um, uh, Jeff, any final tips for people? Um, one or two things to, well, on how to handle this. Ralph, I'm, I, if you'll permit me, I wanted to end with a story. Um, in these days with uh, all professional sports shut down, I think there's a more need than ever for sports analogies. And I grew up in Chicago in some pretty dark days for professional sports in the 70s. Uh, so we all followed DePaul University basketball. And they had a legendary coach named Ray Meyer, coached DePaul for 42 years, went to the postseason 20 sometimes in that, in that era. And he had a saying that the most important two minutes of a basketball game is the first two minutes of the second half. His thinking was that any decent coach given three or four days can prepare for their opponent. But at halftime, you've got 15 minutes to prepare, not for the team you thought you were going to face, but the team you're actually facing. And you've got to outthink the other coach who's making his adjustments in his locker room. Uh, and so that first two minutes really tells whether the, the coach is earning his pay. And so I think that's, that's my analogy for this time. Are we using this time just to uh, adjust and adapt and get through it and muddle through it and hope that our budgets don't get cut? Or are we using this time to gather the team, make those adjustments, and we'll be, we'll be ready to come roaring out on offense when the whistle blows to start the next half? Very interesting and good analogy, okay? Getting, getting ready for what's uh, – and making the adjustments in the framework of a strategy. And, and you have to adjust and, the strategy. Again, if you need tools for that, get in touch right. with us. Jerry, and, and you any, don't have, any, I was just going to say, add, Ralph, and you don't have a six-month planning cycle to do that. Yeah, I know, I know. And uh, <laughs> frameworks are really important now for rapid reaction. Yeah, Jerry. Well, I couldn't possibly top that story, Jeff. That really <laughs> yeah, that's a tough act to follow. Um, but but I, I would, again, I think it's the same thing. This is that opportunity when you're not traveling and it's, it's, I always wonder how executives who go from meeting to meeting to meeting, when do they ever get to just sit at their desk and read and think? And I think that's what this opportunity is. And you use it to do uh, you know, early stage planning for innovation and new product development or strategy or any of those things. It, it's a great opportunity uh, to, to prepare for the second half, as you said, Jeff. And, and by the way, folks, Jeff's book is a great read. It's a fast read. Um, by, and uh, there's a list of great ones coming, okay? Um, uh, Laura Patterson has just come out with a new book on, um, on driving growth. Very well done. I'm about halfway through it. Excellent, excellent book with a different kind of take to it. And again, I'm waiting for Eric Jakobstaller's book on uh, interaction field marketing. And by the way, if you're sitting at home and need some ideas on what to read, I, uh, we got a bunch of them. And, and Ralph, uh, available as an ebook if you don't you don't even have to touch it or touch the box. That's right. You can uh, you can get it delivered in touchless uh, form uh, exactly. the same way as your pizza. Um, so I want to say profuse thanks to all of you. I know that in, in my career in business to business, occasionally, uh, and I was at Texas Instruments, I'd be alone in my office thinking that I was unloved. Okay, people didn't recognize always what I was trying to do. Let me make one thing clear to all of you. We love you. I love you. If you're having a hard time and you just need someone who gets it, don't hesitate to call us. Don't hesitate. That's what this network is about. Uh, and, um, you know, a good idea that we will, we will all get through this and come out on the other side. Special thanks to Jeff, Jerry, Steve, who I kind of pressed into service, Tim, who we kind of put you on the spot, and to all of you. And if you have any other ideas on what we should cover, tips we, that you have discovered from the field that you might be willing to share, or other ways this sort of experience can be made better for you, please do get them to us. So Lynn, I'm gonna turn it back to you to put a final bow on all this, okay? Thank you, I, I, I am so grateful for the folks that have been typing to me as this goes along as well. And uh, so we're gonna, I'm gonna gather up some of those and send them out as sh uh, shared tips for everyone to see if, uh, if they didn't come out to, to the whole group. And we have a couple of really interesting new polls to run for next time that people are talking to me about. So we'll, we'll add those and I hope to hear from you next week. But as Ralph says, we're here. You can find us by email or text or phone. And if there's something we can do or just hang out and talk, please do that. Thanks so much, Ralph. Thanks so much, Jerry and Jeff for today. This will be recorded and available on our website in about a day or so when we get to post it up. Um, and thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Have a good one. Thank you. Take care of one another and be safe. You too.